Well, good morning, folks. Or it might just be the evening that you're tuning in. If that's the case, good evening to you. Uh, it, it might not even be Sunday. It might be Monday that you're tuning into this or Tuesday. Listen, whenever you're tuning in, I am glad that you've chosen to take your time and spend it with me in some Bible study as we continue to take a look at the eternal state. Questions about the afterlife. You're driving this thing, and of course, what I mean by that is I've asked you to send in questions, and you have responded to that magnificently. Thank you so very much for sending in questions. And we have been opening the Word together as I have read your questions, and we have been seeing what kind of insight we can gain from the Spirit concerning these great questions. And so we've got a couple that we need to deal with today. Uh, I'm going to reach over here to my right off this little table. I'm going to get this first question. Now, uh, whoops, that's the wrong one. This is the right one. Uh, I, if you were here with us Wednesday night, if you tuned in on Wednesday night, I gave you a little preview of what we were going to deal with, the questions that we were going to deal with today. And so we're going to look at those. Let me remind you what they are. Here is the first one. Someone asked, what do you think of the belief that the wicked will eventually be exterminated? Uh, what do I think of the belief that the wicked will eventually be exterminated. Maybe you have heard that, or maybe that is a new concept to you, that there is a belief that is out there. Uh, it has kind of grown in popularity over the last few years uh, that the wicked who die are not going to spend eternity in a conscious hell. They're not going to consciously exist in hell for all eternity they are going to actually be annihilated. Uh, their punishment will ultimately be that they will cease to exist. In fact, sometimes it's called the doctrine of annihilation. Now, there's, there's some different forms of it. There are, uh, there, there's one particular form. Uh, there's really kind of about three different forms. Uh, one particular form is that uh, the wicked are annihilated at death. Now, a group that believes that the wicked are not annihilated at death is, is really the, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses would be a, a group that believes the wicked are annihilated when they die. Actually, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe that everybody is annihilated when they die. We all cease to exist. You might remember me telling you that, uh, that the Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe in the duality of man. They don't believe that uh, we're both a physical, we have a physical dimension and we have a soul or spirit. And that soul and, or spirit can continue to exist apart from the physical body. They don't believe that. Uh, they believe man's nature is uh, is really kind of monolithic. Uh, that is the, the soul, that he's the, just one. There is no separate soul and spirit that exists independently. So they believe when man dies, uh, not only do we physically cease to exist, we just cease to exist, period. And they believe that when Jesus comes back, then uh, the righteous will be resurrected and then we're going to once again uh, have conscious existence. So they believe that we're all exterminated, uh, annihilated when we die. And so uh, that's one form of it. Just after we die, uh, we're all annihilated. We no longer exist anymore. And, uh, you know, those who are ir were irretrievably wicked, uh, they're going to be denied any resurrection of the dead. Uh, we're going to be resurrected, though. Uh, they do believe that there's going to be some who weren't irretrievably wicked, and, and they are going to be resurrected and given a second chance uh, during what they believe is the millennium. And if they fail again, if they don't avail themselves of that second chance, then they are going to again be annihilated and then forever be extinct. So one form of annihilationism uh, is the view that, uh, that the wicked are forever extinct after they die. There's another view that says, no, everybody will be raised and stand before God on the day of judgment and then the wicked are going to be cursed with eternal non-existence after the day of judgment. The Seventh-day Adventists would be a group that believes that. The third view of annihilationism is the one that's most uh, commonly held by what uh, people would call evangelicals. Uh, evangelicals are uh, those who have a very high view of Scripture. They're they're, you know, when we talk about Seventh Day Adventist groups and Jehovah's Witnesses, those groups are outside of 
uh, kind of mainstream Christian thinking. They're more heretical groups. Uh, then you've got kind of the mainstream groups uh, that have embraced historic Christian teaching about the nature of God and things like that. Uh, and, and who believe that, you know, the Bible is what it claims to be and that is the, the written word of God. That this is a God book. God is its ultimate author and it is error free in its original documents. Uh, well, uh, that w- most people who would put themselves in that category uh, would put themselves in the category of evangelicals. So the form of annihilationism that exists among some evangelicals, and let me emphasize this, it is not the prominent view among evangelicals. Uh, the, the view, the prominent view, the most dominant view among uh, mainstream Bible-believing uh, people is the traditional view. And the traditional view is that the wicked spend eternity uh, in a Christless hell, that they consciously exist in a, a, a place of terrible torment that the Bible calls hell. That's still the overwhelmingly dominant view among Bible-believing uh, people. Uh, but like I said, it's kind of been a growing, uh, there's been a growing number, uh, even among evangelicals who believe that this, uh, this idea that the wicked are going to be annihilated or eternally extinguished and become eternally extinct after they die. Well, among evangelicals, what they typically do, those who hold this view of annihilation, uh, they believe in uh, a form of it called equitable punishment annihilation. Now, what that means is this. They believe that uh, the, the wicked aren't going to immediately become extinct like the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. Uh, instead, they believe that the wicked will spend... Uh, some period in a conscious, uh, a, a conscious hell. They will consciously exist in a place of torment that the Bible calls hell. And the length of time that they'll spend there just depends on the severity of their sins. Uh, you know, uh, Hitler and Stalin, they're going to spend a long time there. Uh, then other people who are, you know, good people, but everybody are sinners, they may spend a short time there. So an equitable punishment annihilation that everybody will, ever, all wicked will experience some period of time consciously in hell, but eventually, uh, after they have uh, paid uh, the punishment, they have, you know, paid their debt, uh, then they will be uh, extinct. God will banish them to non-existence. So like I said, that view is, is actually growing. Well, I think that view has to be rejected. I still absolutely believe from the very bottom of my heart that the Scriptures teach emphatically that the duration of hell for unbelievers, for the wicked, is uh, the same as the duration of heaven is uh, for God's people, and that is it is eternal in its nature. Uh, Let's begin by taking a look at a couple of passages, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament, So in the Old Testament, turn over to the book of Daniel. Uh, The book of Daniel, when you get to the book of Daniel, when you find it, go to chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, we want to look at verse 2. I'll tell you what, let's just start reading at verse 1 though. How about that? Now at that time, Michael, the chief prince, or the great prince rather, who stands guard over the sons of your people will arise... And there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found, written in the book, will be rescued. Now verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Okay, notice what he talks about as he talks about resurrection. There will be some who will be raised to everlasting life, and there will be some who will be raised to everlasting contempt. Okay, now turn over to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. This is a scene at judgment. Jesus himself is speaking here as he describes the judgment day. When you get there in Matthew chapter 25, I want you to look down at verse 46 and notice what Jesus says as he winds up this this description of the day of judgment. He says, These will go away into eternal punishment, 
but the righteous into eternal life. Okay, now think about those two verses. We could look at a lot more, but those two really are sufficient. As he contrasts the two destinies of people. Uh, One, Daniel says in Daniel chapter 12, one destiny is everlasting contempt. Uh, In Matthew, Jesus calls it eternal punishment. Eternal punishment, everlasting contempt. Uh, The other destiny is everlasting life or eternal life. Now, I want you to notice there, and this is really important, there's obviously intended to be symmetry in both of those verses. Uh, What I mean by there's obviously intended to be symmetry is uh, the writer is obviously saying, you know, as Matthew is recording Jesus' very words here in Matthew chapter 25, he's obviously taking the two destinies and he's applying the same duration to both. Uh... Everlasting life and everlasting punishment. Or again in the book of Daniel, uh, or eternal life, eternal punishment in, in, in the book of Matthew. Uh, everlasting life and everlasting contempt in the book of Daniel. And so you, you, there, that's parallelism there. Uh, those two destinies are paralleled and their duration is paralleled. And it, if you deny that, uh, that existence in hell is is everlasting or is eternal, you're not doing justice to the parallelism between eternal punishment and eternal life. Uh, so again, clearly there's intended in these passages to be symmetry there. And so there is no question that hell is eternal. You know, if we had time, we could also look at a lot of different passages. I'm thinking of Matthew 18, 8, where the fire is called eternal. Uh, you can also see that in Matthew 25 and verse 41. Uh, it's called a place in uh, that we just looked at here in Matthew chapter 25, eternal punishment in verse 46. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9, it's called eternal destruction. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 2, it's called eternal judgment. That word eternal is attached to it over and over and over again in Scripture. And so to deny the eternal duration of punishment is to destroy what appears to be an intended symmetry in Scripture. Now, Let me tell you what some of the main arguments for those who believe in annihilation is. Let's talk about those for a minute and and kind of respond to those arguments. One of the main arguments used by annihilationists is the language that the New Testament uses uh, as it talks about those who are condemned. And they'll say the language that is used uh, can, can be only interpreted as annihilation. Well, what kind of language are you talking about? Well, we're talking about this kind of language. Destruction and destroy and death. You know, the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. Or Matthew 10.28, God will destroy both soul and body in hell. He would destroy, uh, Matthew says. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 1.9, They'll pay the penalty of eternal destruction. So destruction and destroy and death. Uh, And so they say those words can only describe extinction. Those words can only describe annihilation. Well, that's simply not true. That is just not fairly representing those biblical terms. You know, the reality is most terms in Scripture uh, can have a variety of meanings. And it's not just most terms in Scripture. It's, it's most terms, period, in any language. And we've talked about that before. Uh, almost every word has a, uh, to one extent or another, has a wide lexical range. That is, it has more than one meaning. Some words may have a couple. Some words may have ten different meanings. And you have to determine its meaning by its context. Well, we know the same thing about these words that are used to describe punishment, our eternal punishment. Words like destroy and words like death and words like uh, like destruction. 
Uh, one of the things that we know about these words, for instance, is that they also have the connotation of ruin, uh, not annihilation. Uh, they have the connotation of lo uh, being lost or being spoiled or being wasted. These words are often used uh, in senses that uh, annihilation clearly isn't in the picture. Uh, let me give you a couple of four instances. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. And uh, let's take a look at this. Matthew chapter 9. When you get there, look at verse 17. Matthew chapter 9, verse 17. This is when Jesus talks about putting new wines in old wineskins. And he says, nor do people put new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wineskins burst. And the wine pour, and the wine pours out, and the wine skins are ruined. That word ruined there, that's one of those words that's often used to describe eternal punishment in, in the sense of destruction, uh, or, uh, uh, destruction or just being destroyed. Uh, but that doesn't mean when it says the wine skins are ruined, because as you put this new wine into old brittle wine skins, and that wine begins to ferment and it expands, these Old wineskins that are brittle can't expand, and so they'll rupture and all the wine spit out. Well, they may rupture and they're destroyed, but that doesn't mean they no longer exist, that the wineskins are extinct. It just means uh, they've lost their value. It means they have been ruined, uh, not annihilated. Well, if you turn over one chapter to Matthew chapter 10 and you look down at verse 6, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, the word lost there uh, is, again, uh, uh, one of those words that's used, but it's clearly not being used here in the sense of being annihilated. Uh, the house of Israel hasn't been annihilated. They're simply lost. Uh, in Mark chapter 3 and verse 6, we're told, well, let's just turn over there. Mark chapter 3 and verse 6. We're told that the Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him, that is against Jesus, as to how they might destroy him. Well, they weren't looking to annihilate Jesus. Uh, they weren't looking to make him uh, extinct. That's not the idea of he here at all. Uh, Mark chapter 14, stay in the Gospel of Mark. Look over in Mark chapter 14. When you get there, look at verse 4. Uh, this was uh, when uh, this woman in verse 3, uh, take a look at verse 3. When he, that is Jesus, was at, in Bethany and at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial, a very costly perfume and pure nard. And she broke the vial and poured it over his head. Now look at verse 4. But some were indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? And the word wasted there is the word that I want us to focus on. Uh, here again is one of those words that's often used to describe eternal destruction or uh, being destroyed uh, eternally. Uh, but here it certainly doesn't mean that the perfume was annihilated. Uh, it's wasted. And so... We have to understand these words. So when someone who believes in annihilation says, well, it has to be annihilation because look at these words that describe uh, our e eternal uh, punishment. It's words like destruction and destroy. That can only mean annihilation. And, and it doesn't mean that. Uh, it, it just simply refers to uh, something has, that has lost its meaning, it's lost its peace, it's lost its value, it's lost its usefulness, it doesn't necessarily mean to pass out of existence. And uh, and so uh, I, I don't think that's a strong argument that destruction, uh, in terms of destruction and destroy to describe eternal punishment has to mean annihilation. It simply doesn't. Those words are often used without the concept of annihilation being present. Uh, another argument that annihilation is used to try to support their view uh, is that it's, uh, it, it, it violates God's nature. Now, let me say something about that. 
Um, what do they mean that it violates God's nature? Well, they say God's nature is love. And, and so the concept of eternal punishment is inconsistent. It's in conflict with the concept of love. God is good and God is loving. And, and since God is good and He is loving, there is no way that He can eternally, forever and ever continue to punish someone. And a lot of times you will see words like uh, torture. God can not torture someone. Uh, sometimes you'll see words like uh, uh, cruel and sadistic. That when you punish someone without end... Uh, that's just cruel and sadistic. We don't ever punish someone without end. And so they said this just violates the nature uh, of God's love. Okay, well, what do we say about that? Uh, does it violate the nature of God's love? And, and the answer to that is simply this. As we think about the nature of God... Um, the, the first thing that I would say is to those who believe in the equitable punishment form of annihilation. That is, those who believe that all, all lost people will experience uh, some form of agonizing punishment before they're annihilated. And I would say, well, listen, if, if you're just, if you are rejecting uh, the concept of, et of eternal punishment based on God's love, then why do you even accept, uh, you know, a, a temporary torture chamber if you believe that God is love? If God is love, uh, why would He torture anyone if that's the language that you want to use? Uh, that's why a lot of people who just focus on the love of God and, and simply describe God's nature in terms of love, that's why they are, are what's called universalists. They don't even believe that, you know, that God will punish anyone. God's going to save everyone because that's what love does. God is love. But here's the main thing, uh, main response to that. Uh, the main response to that is God's love is not the only aspect of His nature. It is absolutely true that God is love. And... And it's that nature of God that makes Him long to save us. Uh, it's that aspect of God's love that delays the coming of Jesus. He loves us so much, He doesn't want anyone to be eternally separated from Him. And so He longs uh, for us to be. He longs to forgive. He longs to extend grace and mercy because He's loved. That is one aspect of His nature. But also... Uh, it, there is another aspect to God's nature, and that is holiness and wrath. And maybe we need to remind ourselves of that. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, when you get there, look at verse 29. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 29, uh, where the Hebrew writer describes God this way. Our God is a consuming fire. God is a consuming fire. Look at Romans chapter 11. Notice what Paul says about God. Romans chapter 11, look down at verse 22. Romans eleven twenty-two. 22. Behold the kindness and severity of God. To those who fail, severity. But to you, God's kindness, if you continue in His kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And so the kindness of God and the severity of God. Uh, he is a God of love and He is a God of holiness. And His wrath is a part of His holy nature. He has this deep-seated, deep-settled hatred of sin. And He has to punish it because He is infinitely holy. Turn over to James chapter 4. Look at James chapter 4. When you get there, look at verse 12. James chapter 4 and verse 12. James says, There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? There's one who saves, and there is one who destroys. Uh, look at Hebrews chapter 10. We've already been to the book of Hebrews, but let's go back to the book of Hebrews, this time to chapter 10. Look at verse 30 and 31. For we know him who said, 
Vengeance is mine. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Um, it, it, and take a look at verse 31. Let's continue. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That statement is made right on the heels of God as judge. And so the idea that, uh, that eternal punishment is inconsistent with the love of God uh, simply is a, uh, you know, it, 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 it's someone who is mistakenly focused on one aspect of God's nature. We cannot forget that God is not only love, but He is holiness, holy as well. And His holiness has to punish. Uh, an, another uh, argument that says, uh, that, that really uses God's nature to try to support annihilationism is that uh, not only is God a God of love, He can't punish eternally because love doesn't do that, but He is perfect justice. God is infinitely just. And eternally punishing someone is simply not just. Uh, it is not a just and righteous expression of His holy wrath. You know, that would mean... You know, uh, if, if this were true, then, then think about it. You know, even sinners who were really good people and tried to reflect God's character, even though they weren't conscious of it, but they, uh, were, were kind and compassionate and, and helpful and sensitive to hurting people. They just didn't, they just refused to accept Christ, but they lived a, 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 a generally moral life and, and compare them with, the, the butcher Adolf Hitler. I mean, how in, how could anyone say that it is just for God to punish both of those people, Hitler and, and, and Stalins of the world against these, what we might call, uh, minor rebels? You know, how's that just? Well, I, I think the answer to that is, first of all, that, uh, God's Justice is preserved in, in the fact that there are, uh, different intensities, uh, when it comes to eternal suffering. Uh, we really don't have time to deal with it now. The, the, the clock is, is really ticking away. And so, uh, but there are, the Bible clearly teaches that there are degrees of, of punishment. And so that certainly satisfies God's justice. I understand the whole argument that all center, you know, mild rebels and then the Hitlers and Stalins of the world, how could justice be served by both being punished equal? Well, the Bible clearly teaches that some are, are beaten with few stripes and some are many. And so, uh, that certainly preserves, uh, the, 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 the justice of God. Uh, but, uh, but then the, a lot of times people will respond that uh, you know, uh, any kind of suffering is is contrary to God's justice. Um, any kind of eternal suffering, even if it's mild eternal suffering, okay, someone may say, I'll give you that. I'll give you that there are degrees of punishment. But even if it's a more mild form of eternal punishment, it's still eternal. And so even a mild form of eternal punishment would certainly seem to be unjust. Uh, well, I think the response to that is uh, we need to allow God to determine what is just and, and we don't need to dictate to Him what is just. God is perfect justice. And if God deems... Uh, eternal punishment for all sin to be just, then we can't question the justice of that. Now, there's a couple of other things to th think about, though, here. And that is, is this. First of all, keep in mind that, you know, God doesn't send anyone to hell, uh, uh just arbitrarily. God doesn't do that. Uh, God gives us the freedom to obey. God gives us free will. Uh, sin and rebellion uh, is is our choice. 
Uh, He's provided Christ to pay for all of our sins. And and, and so no one can say that uh, we we suffer the eternal consequences of sin, um, you know, that, that God is responsible for that. Uh, ultimately, I'm responsible for that. Um, I, you know, God warned me. And, and as we preach, we, we preach that warning. And, and, uh, we, we, uh, we let people know that it's their choice. God wants them to be saved. And so no one goes to hell, uh, by God's arbitrary, uh, decision. And then, of course, again, just keep in mind what I say. We have to allow the re, uh, for the reality of degrees of punishment uh, as well. Uh, so, uh, all in all, I, I know there's more that we could say on this, and I, I really wish we had a little bit more time to, to speak on this, but I, I think we've kind of dealt with it sufficiently. So what do I think about, let me sum it up, about the idea that the wicked will be eventually exterminated? I, I don't think it's a biblical position at all. Uh, again, we looked at only two passages that show what seems to be intentional symmetry between uh, the two eternal states. Uh, everlasting contempt and everlasting life in Daniel 12.2. And then, of course, in Matthew 12.46, eternal punishment and eternal life. Uh, the duration of punishment uh, is, uh, is the same in those verses uh, as the duration of life. And so I, I don't think we do justice to that intentional symmetry that's presented if we reject uh, the uh, eternal duration uh, of hell. And and again, they're trying to use, uh, and then the argument that uses words like destroy and destruction has to mean annihilation. No, we looked at that, and that's simply not true. Those words are often used to describe uh, being ruined and losing their usefulness and their purpose. So annihilation certainly isn't in view. And then the argument that uh, that eternal punishment some way violates God's love. Well, that's uh, simply not true uh, because God's nature is bigger than love. That's just one side of His nature. His other side of His nature is holiness. And uh, and the notion that it violates God's justice. Uh, and, and the answer is to that is no, it doesn't violate God's justice. Let God, who is infinitely just, determine what is just. But keep in mind the degrees of reward and punishment uh, that are there. And the fact that God doesn't just send anyone arbitrarily there, He's warned us. He has sent uh, Christ to be the means of deliverance from there. And more than anything, He wants us to stay out of there. Uh, His love wants to spare us. His justice demands that sin be punished. Okay, good question. I was hoping that we could get to a second question today, but I was afraid that this question needed a little bit of expanded discussion. And so we're going to continue this Wednesday night. i got a couple of more questions that have been sent in. The next one we're going to deal with is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where the Bible says in verse 16 of chapter 4 that we're going to be caught up together with Jesus in the air when He comes back. Our bodies are going to be raised and we're going to forever be with the Lord. Take a look and see what that means. Well, listen, thanks for joining us today. I'm glad that you were here. Uh, I have been so enjoying this. I'm so glad that you've been responding like you have by sending in the questions. And if you have any more, it's still not too late to send them in any questions at all on our eternal state. I'll be glad to take a look at that. Uh, Again, stay safe. I miss you. I love you. Hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.